Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sushil, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the young brigade at uh, Harmoon India for this kind introduction and for this very successfully attended uh, program today. I'm going to be spending the next 15 minutes, can I ask the host to set a timer, uh, to take you through the multidisciplinary management of PCOS um, or what might be multidisciplinary in our minds and what might be some of the lacunae that uh, probably we haven't been able to address completely, which possibly makes uh, the management of PCOS a little easier, maybe two or three decades from now. So we all know that this is an extremely common uh, condition. It's the most common endocrine disorder in women of reproductive conditions. And it's only set to increase with all the effects of our current lifestyle. Uh, we can uh, have multiple debates about whether this is genetic or whether this is environmental, but we will all agree that uh, the prevalence is only going to increase. We've also probably made peace with the fact that this is no longer just a reproductive condition. It is a metabolic disease. In fact, uh, one of the major challenges in pulling out guidelines for this condition has been that there have been numerous arguments about uh, the name itself. There are many people who want to change it to many other things, but we do know now that this is uh, predominantly uh, an endocrine slash metabolic condition, which probably presents with some reproductive symptoms, which makes it uh, a condition which is probably likely to be presented to a pediatrician or a gynecologist first. Um, and in this context of uh, management of all of these uh, heterogeneous presentations, which could be possible with PCOS, uh, we are now very comfortable with bringing on a dermatologist on board, bringing in a gynecologist on board, maybe even bringing in a nutritionist or a dietitian on board. Uh, definitely endocrinologists believe that we are at the heart of the fulcrum of PCOS management, whether it is true or not in clinical practice. Uh, but we do know that we, we, we form a very important part of coordinating this care. But, uh, probably the attribute about PCOS, uh, which hasn't received all the attention that is due, is the fact that uh, this is a condition which is heavy with many, many uh, psychosocial issues, be it related to body image, self-esteem, depression, and anxiety. And now as a young endocrinologist, you might be thinking, uh, what's in it for me? Uh, why should I bother uh, or care to pause about this? I'm already screening for numerous metabolic complications. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are all trying to improve outcomes for our patients and also improve the journey of reaching that outcome for our patients. So with that in mind, um, uh, I'm going to make an argument uh, saying that, yes, while we are all comfortable with bringing in all of these people to address these various manifestations, I think the missing piece in this jigsaw puzzle is to bring on a psychologist and I'm going to make my case for the same. So much of my argument is based on two large studies that we've done in the last year or two. Uh, and this is a study called as the Blue Morpho, which we had the good fortune to collaborate with the University of Birmingham. Uh, and my co-collaborator from India is Dr. Tejal from Mumbai. We're extremely passionate about this work. And this is work which we did in the middle of the crazy COVID pandemic. So it kind of adapted to the demands of that time. And this was an international survey done to assess the emotional and the psychosocial well-being uh, amongst women in PCOS. And uh, it, the focus was to look at uh, emotional well-being, screening for anxiety and depression, psychosocial well-being in the form of body dysmorphism and weight stigma, and sexual well-being as well. There is... Uh, nothing subversive about looking at sexual function at all. There is uh, enough evidence to suggest that sexual dysfunction strongly correlates with um, well-being uh, in women's health. So this is what we set out to do. So this happened in two phases. The UK uh, arm uh, went on in September and October and uh, India joined them in May and June. And uh, what we did then was to um, have a scale out a questionnaire which patients answered from their phones and we collated all this information and the questionnaires which were used were four validated questionnaires one is the hospital anxiety and depression questionnaire this is very commonly used it's a very important screening tool for both of these conditions we also looked at the body image questionnaire 
So higher the score, greater the body dysmorphism. We also looked at the beliefs about obese people's score, which is to assess the patient's perception about weight stigma during their clinic visits. And also we looked at the female sexual function index. Again, here higher score indicates uh, sexual dysfunction. We had the unique opportunity to look at the differences of the prevalence of these conditions based on the ethnicity and also the country of origin. We recruited close to 1,000 patients with self-reported PCOS. Of course, this was done online during the pandemic, so there was no way. Uh, so if the patient had ever been told that they had PCOS, they were able to participate. Uh, we had close to 75% of people who were white in British ethnicity. India contributed about 453 uh, patients to the entire survey, up to 44% of them were between 26 to 35 years. And what we found was the prevalence of anxiety overall in the total cohort was about 60%. That's roughly two thirds of all women had anxiety, about one fourth of them had depression and about 8% had both anxiety and depression. A good 38% of women, irrespective of which country they came from, had body dysmorphism and sexual well-being was very poor overall uh, with a total score of around 20. Overall, uh, the score was 36. So higher the score, greater the dysfunction. So we were quite uh, surprised with these findings. And when we are trying to look at, I'm sure this is just a UK based uh, phenomenon. I'm sure our patients are not as um, afflicted by these conditions. And this was the breakup of the subgroup to take a look at the ethnicity. While body dysmorphism was definitely more prevalent in the white ethnicity, depression was more prevalent in the Indian ethnicity uh, individuals, whereas anxiety was maybe equally divided between the two groups. So the take home message from this uh, uh, screening prevalence study was that there is a very high prevalence. But we were always wondering about the methodology because this was a link which was sent out and this was always a self-reported study. So we went ahead and did another aspect of the study where we screened for this ourselves in our clinic. And again, here we had two spots in which we did the study, one in India. Uh, here the collaborators were Dr. Tejal Latia and me. And again, the other group to compare with was the University of Birmingham PCOS clinic. So when they came into the clinic, before they even spoke to the doctor, they did their hospital anxiety and depression score, administered about five minutes prior, just after their registration. And post-clinic, the review uh, included their patient experience of the entire consult and then uh, what all recommendations they got. And what we found here was similar to the findings that we found there, that body image issues of body dysmorphism affected close to 40%. Anxiety was reported in about 25% and depression to the tune of around 25%. So again, here in the patients who are meeting your clinic as well. So even while you might think that self-reported mental health issues might be greater, even in our clinics, um, we found this to be higher. Uh, of course, we've not studied rural India. We've not studied... Uh, subgroups of the urban ethnicity, both Tejal and I are in uh, metro cities. So we've probably catered to the urban, uh, probably uh, women alone might not be representative, but these are still numbers which are very high. And this is similar to the numbers which are reported in literature. If you review PCOS and mental health conditions, the number of papers which have come out in the last decade are amazing. And there is also a strong predisposition for eating disorders in women with PCOS. Now, if you're wondering why we have to talk about this as an endocrinologist. My job is to prevent diabetes, prevent GDM, uh, prevent maybe infertility, all of those. That is probably because behavioral change itself is a science in it by itself. All of us know that the first three roles of management is lifestyle changes in PCOS, but you and I never received any training in how to effect behavioral change, especially in chronic conditions, especially in a vulnerable population who might have a very high prevalence of mental health conditions, which we probably do not have much experience in handling. Some of us might be more aware than the others. So we might have now understood that there are stages to change. We know this in the context of insulin when it comes to type 2 diabetes, right? That you might need to give your patient time to contemplate, to prepare for it, and then to take action. We might in the same way 
draw meaning from this and apply it into our clinical practice when we effect behavioral changes. But this is the super, most superficial layer of behavioral change. I'm going to just delve into one such program, which is trying to design lifestyle uh, changes or behavioral change around lifestyle as a model for diabetes. And this is the scheme by which they plan to work. So if you take a look at it, uh, they have a very systematic way in identifying the barriers, finding out the function which is likely to address the barrier, and then having therapies which are particularly designed for the barrier that you've identified to then implement it. Like, for example, they have issues like goal setting. While goal setting seems like a very, very simple thing, the art of goal setting itself is something which they study for a few um, hours or months. So uh, this is, again, something which we've been learning because our patients are coming back and telling us that uh, while they are working with psychologists who are, yes, screening for mental health issue, but also behaving as behavioral therapists who are finding them um, doable actions to bring uh, closer their lifestyle changes, implement it and sustain those changes. Uh, this is another uh, very uh, easily um, implemented behavioral change wheel which they follow, similar to how you identify the stages of change that your patient is ready for. And these are some of the other techniques that they use, which uh, we are slowly beginning to learn. Apparently, nudging is a technique which works in particular individuals who have a certain predisposition. Boosting is another way. But at the end of the end of the day, they're all working towards behavioral change. So just to pause and think with this information that I've just told you, the guidelines now say that asking about emotional well-being and managing of the same as appropriate is a recommendation now. The new guideline by NICE is being written right now as we speak and will be out in a, in a year or so, which will be properly um, including all of the data which is that, that which was presented now. But nobody's even taught us how to screen for emotional well-being. So if you need just one single indicator, one or two questions to ask about these particular things, I think is the message I'd want the audience to leave with. Over the last two weeks, how often have you felt bothered by these problems, feeling down, depressed or hopeless, or not finding any interest or pleasure for doing things? Over the last two weeks, how often have you felt nervous, anxious, or on the edge, not being able to stop or control worrying? If any of these responses are positive, so that's one question for depression and one question for anxiety, you probably need to send them in for screening. And I would only, only wish that you go back and try this and you will be amazed at the number of women who will be grateful uh, that you suggested screening. If they're unwilling to meet a person, send them the link to one of the screening questionnaires and let them take a question. So from the work that we've done and from the findings uh, which is published already, mental health concerns are very, very prevalent. You know, screening for them is imperative. All behavioral changes depends on your mental well-being. A person who's uh, struggling with anxiety and depression is probably not very uh, able to implement the lifestyle changes, but then we go on and we blame them for not making those lifestyle changes, which would cure them of their PCOS. So providing the adequate support for them to sort all of this out probably is the best step out. And we have a good bunch of people who are trained in this exactly, and probably we should seek help from all the psychologists. So my parting away message would be uh, that the audience would think about this the next time they're meeting a woman with PCOS. Uh, that's my email ID and my Twitter handle if you have any questions and ready to take it. Thank you so much, Hamon India. Yeah.